Oh, it is. Hey, good morning. Hi, Andrew. You're looking young and well. I don't actually think I look that much younger than Andrew. I didn't take that as a compliment. That 108-year-old Buddhist monk that's doing the rounds on Instagram at the moment that looks like uh, Clay Maddox, he looks younger than Andrew. <laughs> he looks worse every time I see him, Andrew. It was his well, birthday yesterday. We should say no. This yeah. is the Andrew birthday. Potter birthday edition. Happy uh, birthday, Andrew, Andrew Potter. For, for you to be replacement Andrew today here, we're going to do a flashcard system where we're going to put certain Thai words on and you're going to do the pronunciation. Yeah. Can, you start, <laughs> can you start by pronouncing Andrew's full gym name? I don't think he can do it anymore. <laughs> What's that doing on that? It's just... <laughs> <laughs> You really I haven't, heard, it. I haven't yeah. heard Andrew's rendition in a while. Well, anyway, we could spend a full hour. This is, you asked about it. Um, Hugh's nice enough to replace Andrew today on his tour of Nam. Um, he's just flying out in a helicopter with uh, painted black playing in the background. Um, and Hugh was nice enough to ask Kieran and I what the agenda was for today. I'm very professional. So naive. It's like so it's young. Like, it's like. Pink in the brain. What are we going to do today? We're going to take over the world. What are we going to talk about tomorrow? I don't know. So back Andrew, back Kieran, back so and reverse it. We're 25 episodes in and we're just kind of semi-developing a structure which we just know and it's just in the back of our heads. We kind of just... we had a structure at the start, remember? Yeah, for like two and a half episodes and then it went out the window. That was 20, 22 and a half hours ago. What a time investment. We, a should, lot of we should do a flashback. Well, that was that was, that was that was that was the uh that was lockdown, wasn't it? That's why we started it, because we were in lockdown and we wanted something to do. Yeah. Yeah. So here we are, 25 hours later. We've replaced Andrew Parnham already <laughs> <laughs> in less than a day's worth of content. And um, yeah, we're here. What a journey. I'm proud of you guys. What a journey. I encourage you to use the word journey as much as possible. Speaking of journey here, how'd you pull up from your last fight? I pulled up really well. Yeah, no bump. And how awesome was the commentary on your last fight? Commentary was excellent. And Sounds of Sydney typically has um, pretty poor quality commentary. So I'm sure a breath of fresh air for the audience. Yeah, it was a slightly more fast paced than normal, the commentary. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was better than the time that you filmed the show. That time that you live streamed Siam to Sydney, and it looked like one of those really bodgy, like early two thousands video camera recorder that people used to snuck into the movies. Sorry, to- um, Kieran, are you speaking to me? Yeah, I'm talking. Yeah, mate, I'm talking. Right. About- so you, you probably wasn't born then, man. What are you talking about? Of course, I'm talking. So to you. you wouldn't know. What- Come so on. So you know what I had to do that day. No, please. I was common. I don't know. Well, you're being a motherfucker, so I'm trying to help. <laughs> we all know how much Andrew Parnham likes to spend money on his shows. Yes, of course. Oh, I'd like to take the deluxe white plastic garden chairs for this show, please. <laughs> um, so I show up, and he's. I'm coming down to watch his show, and he's got nothing planned. So I brought my Canon G7X or whatever it is, those little blogging mm. cameras that I never blogged with because other than these 24 hours, I sat in the balcony of that place, filmed it, held mm. it up mm. in the round rest break. It wasn't a live stream. I took the, the memory stick this. out, uploaded it to my uh, computer, put another memory stick up and uploaded that as that was happening. That's what I did for that motherfucker. Move over Paris. <laughs> and, and the quality wasn't that bad. A new- it, was, it turned out pretty well, man. Thank you, here. Give me live Thank combat you. sports, slightly <laughs> played combat sports. That's your new promotion. That's your new company. Semi- it was like a three-minute three lag. Yeah, that, that's when you were um, still uh, in the world where if you caught kicks but didn't do anything with them, you should win. The <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about, man. Hey, um, okay, so let's talk about Thai boxing related stuff and let's make you stay along with us on the journey. Let's do it in reverse. Let's look at some Aussie Muay Thai and what we have on this weekend. 
I'm when going you up the to the Sunshine State, Mr. I am, yes, I'm up to the Sunshine State. We're now officially on the t- same time zone um, because Daylight Savings has ended. Technically, though, it is 1984, still in Queensland. This is correct, yes. Uh, same time of day, different, different era. 1984. Yes, 1984. So we've got... Uh, we've got the 1984. Now it's going to trigger a bunch of people again. Yeah, <laughs> we've got the all, we've got the all uh, female card on this weekend. Muay Thai League ran by Nikia Wright and Nicole Banny. The main event being the world title, the WBC world title. Semi main event being the national title, and then an all female under. I can't remember. Was the last all-female show we had in Australia the uh, Dennis Ran Dynamite show in Melbourne? Dynamite Naksu, I believe, yeah. YOLO versus Amar, I think, was the last one. And was it done before that? I don't think so. I think they did too, did they not? Do you think it's a bit of a marketing mistake on the behalf of the girls in Queensland to only have one world title fight on their show? Like, is it it just going to lose a bit of attraction, like, down from the normal five? (laughs) You're on a roll this morning, man. You're you're a lot. You're I've had this is my uh, third double for the day. You're and today's uh, today's rebellion Muay Thai hour is brought to you by Sekan Jabin. Didn't you give up coffee for a bit? I thought you gave coffee up. <sighs> that refreshing Sekan Jabin, the original Persian that. drink. I'm so happy. It's a mint vinegar sugar drink that you mix with water. It's terrific. I thought you gave coffee up, Sai. I thought you gave uh, jerk face up. When did I give up? <laughs> so, okay, if we're going to look at this um, world title now, and I think it's what it's Kim is. Kim is obviously we've talked about Kim a few times on the podcast. Mm. A lot of people know Kim, and she's been around for a long time. And she's, I think, has only fought for what would be like one official sanction, if not maybe zero official like high level sanction world title because i know she fought um grace spicer from the uk from bad company yeah in queensland but i believe that was like a show belt world title or i don't think it was of any sort of sanction credit she won like a world title overseas oh for some reason ska I- or something i yeah. i thought but i uh I could I'm pretty honest. sure Kim's like one of the few people that's actually gone overseas and won a world title mm-hmm. for some reason. Perhaps, yeah, I can't think of it. But then obviously now this is her chance for the WB. And she fights across multiple weight divisions too. She does, yeah. It's the other thing. She often fights over two or three um, separate weight divisions purely because, I, I mean, her natural weight, I think her natural fight weight would probably be around 49 would be around 48, 49, but she fights upwards of like 51, 52, 53 just to get opponents. So I think, and this, so this is, this, this is at her weight division. And I don't remember the last time Kim actually lost. Who, who did she last lose in Australia? Like as far as contenders for a world title from Australia goes, I think she's as sort of deserved as, as calm. Like she's been sort of dominating those lower weight classes for the last seven or eight years. I mean, there's been times where she hasn't fought that often, but when, when was the last time Kim lost the fight? I don't know. Yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head. What, what are you here for then, Hugh? This is what you were here for. <laughs> I, told, trying I to... told you in the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Research things. <laughs> I'm um, just here to be a punching bag in Andrew's absence. Yes, yes. You've taken the whipping boy position. Well, I... Um, you, um, uh, Yes. Andrew is not the whipping boy and punching bag of this podcast. Old mate who's on mute at the moment generally tends to be, but thanks for playing along. I try to get Kieran a break sometimes. And I'll mute myself. Go fuck you, man. Oh, shit. You can still hear me. All uh, right, I get you. Yeah, I can, he's just mute me. He doesn't mute you. Fuck. Any interruptions. Okay, so um, that is the world title and um, who's the other girl celeste hansen left where is so she fighting out of from is, is is it phuket singer or it's like phuket singer muay thai or phuket muay thai or i thought uh, it was phuket uh top team mm, it's not it's no. one of the phuket ones 
Yeah, I think it's like I think it's called Phuket Singer Muay Thai because her partner is it's the Thai trainer there, and I forget. Oh no, I'm getting him confused. Celeste, yeah, C E L Celeste Henson Muay Thai fighter. Celeste yeah. Henson, yeah. Um, and she is, yeah, I'm getting there confused. So she's an Aussie. Phuket Singer, you are correct. Yeah, Phuket Singer. I'm sorry, I was just getting it confused with another girl that's over there. Um, yes. So first female to fight at Lumpity Champ at Stadium, apparently. She's ranked number one WBC, PK1 world champion, whatever that is, Patong Stadium champion, much like a big fan of the podcast, Matthew Williams. Another yeah, big Matty. Another world champion. Patong Stadium world champion. Um, that man she, offers to defend that title so many times. I've tried to say that I'd go up against him to defend my um, WK New South Wales uh, mod tie title, which I won in uh, 2008. But that could be my big claim to fame. You know how the Japanese sometimes do Raja titles in Japan? I can get it. I can <laughs> get it. <laughs> I'm going to make an announcement for Patong Stadium. No, nah, that would have been a good April Fools, man. You missed on that one. That would have been That fun, would have man. been a great April Fools. So, yeah, we've got that there. And then we have as the semi-main event, um, Victoria's own, the darling of Melbourne, Joanne La, size, one of size favourites. Oh, I've got a matchup for you, by the way, Kieran, for May 28. Okay, thank you. I was waiting. Uh, up against Nakia. Who... That's a good fight. That's a cool fight. That's and I don't fight. think Nikia is, correct me if I'm wrong, Nikia, because you'll probably watch this or Hugh, you, because you're meant to be the encyclopedia here. But I think her last fight was against, um, what's the young girl's name? Erin Harberger. Erin, yes. On Rogue, on, yep. very, on, on our friend of the podcast, Reload Sports' own Adam King. Another shameless plug for you, Adam. Kieran hasn't slept since so he got that. <laughs> I've been triple scooping that and just fucking buzzing through. That'd be a cool fight. Yeah, that'd be, that'll be a good. That'll be a good fight. I think. Jo, I think um, Joanne will be bigger than Nakia. I would say. I feel like Joanne will be bigger than Nakia and. I'm really interested to see how Nakia goes after having the bub and having mm. that time off. It's always interesting to see. But, I mean, if we take a perfect example is um, Soraya. Soraya, Soraya yeah. recently fought against Kim Townsend after she just had Caden, their little one, Caden. And it was, it was the first round. It looked a bit like she had a bit of ring rust, but then she did amazing. It didn't look like the bub or the time off affected her at all. I so, think the yeah. thing with um, Joanne is everyone always thinks she's like really like uh, she's, she's like a big, big girl. She's very lean and her yeah. like, it's like her back muscles and stuff. And a lot of the photos we've ever put up over with her back tattoo make mm. her look uh make her look really big for herself but then you sort of stand next to her and she you know she used to fight 52 kilos um so that's not a problem and i think this fight's what 54 kilos um kieran you being the wbc uh shit stirrer <laughs> uh yeah man it is for the bantamweight national title so what's bantamweight around that I don't yeah. want to say it wrong. I fuck it. Don't, don't hit me with it. And I think with like we get it wrong. I think a lot of like uh, female athletes they they bounce back. I mean, especially if they're not a lot older, they bounce back after having kids really well. And honestly, like I reckon, part of it is if they can get through that. Like a Muay Thai fight's got to be a walk in the park compared to some you know having twenty eight hour labor, eighteen hour labor and stuff. So. Yeah, 53.52. 53.52 is the bantam weight, which is I th- I believe is the also the division that Alma won her world title in. Mm. I believe that was the division that Alma won her world title in in Hong Kong all those yeah. years ago. But this is for the Australian title. This is for the Australian title, yeah, correct. Um and I mean both girls are both Nakia and Joanna are in the are in the rankings in the female rankings for the at the WBC world level because there's about 15 of them in that ranking in that division and I think the girls are sitting between 10 and 15 so no doubt whoever then 
wins this fight would move up a little bit and put them into contention for, say, an international title or, or realistically another national title defence if there's a suitable opponent and then international. And it is a division that's mostly dominated, like, in Asia, it's Thailand and Japan, yep. realistically. And then one one French girl, Cindy Sylvester, who has been fighting for, like... Six years, a million for, years forever <laughs> yeah. ever French girl with the pink hair and is just I think I've been friends with her on Facebook for over a decade I tried to get a match against Pia Pia Salgado once and she's been around forever she's actually she's second with Alma being first so maybe a fight there to be made with Alma mm. and tell me I, Kieran from the WBC perspective if you're in a situation such as Alma's one oh where- we've got the WM, another WMC boy here today. Oh, what a perfect replacement. Why am I a WMC boy? Don't, hope you don't get any legal letters. <laughs> no, That's sorry. Andrew's not here. Just ignore it. You've just got to roll with the punches, man. Don't fight back. Don't get defensive. <laughs> just roll with the punches. Um, I was wondering if, is there like a hard rule on how long you go without defending a world title before it is just made vacant? Or is it that you have to have a suitable, you know, two challenges for the world title and you'll make it vacant for the match. Because, of course, Arma's been inactive for some time now since winning that, but I would imagine still. But does she still hold the title? I, What's a, the um, I don't think it's a... Um, sorry, I don't think it's uh, an automatic uh, va- vacating. They have to be offered fights. Yes. Okay. Um, so, yes. And if, you, if you're saying no to fights and it goes long enough, then then I think it's vacated, but you know, yeah. then it's, then it's, then it's vacated. Exactly. Because you have, um, and take Alma, for example, it is the purely, it would purely be the fact that she is signed with one and therefore yeah. any opportunity that she would have been given would have been declined because she wouldn't have been able to defend it because the likely scenario is that one would have said, no, you can't do it. You can't fight for it. And then that's why she would have had to vacate it. And that was a title that, I, I mean, I'm like Alma won that, pre-pandemic that yes. was a title she won a long time ago so in instances like the pandemic was that in hong kong yeah, yeah. against yeah. zaza zaza yeah yeah against zaza um and there was time say like in the pandemic where there was leniency given to the time that a, that a boxer could hold a title um because it was harder to make suitable matches apparently not in wa though but yeah well and uh yeah so just case by case yeah interesting but yeah she doesn't hold it anymore it's vacant it's okay vacant. And, a few, and a few of those world titles have been vacated as well so hmm. i know joanne's got a crew of 40 girls flying up for the show uh, oh, that's so fun. they've got um uh if you were at the december show on rebellion well you guys both were when joanne and Som fought um those girls all behind me and around the side that had the signs, they're part of JS Muay Thai, yes. Joanne and Som, JS Muay Thai, um, William Street Gym, not on William Street. Um, so they've got, she's got a solid following. So they're all uh, coming up to Queensland for the fight. So I expect they, uh, obviously Nakia is going to have the, the bulk of the supporter base there, but um Joanne's going to have a big troop there with her. Well, hopefully we can get the Victorian. I mean, we're ACT versus Cairns. I, I, I don't really see big crowd support for either of my girls' fights either way. So hopefully, hopefully. They- I think the um, I think the girls, uh, I think the girls that will be there would have seen some and the Venus fight. The Venus. Yeah, and they'll be cheering for her because obviously they won't be cheering for her. At the end of May, so um, <laughs> they'll get out of their system now. All right, all right. Um, so yeah, and I don't, off the top of my head, I don't think there are any other shows this weekend. This is They're a really Oh yeah. shit! <laughs> sorry, Ma. sorry, Emma. Are oh, you a busy man? You're probably not listening to this. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll I'll bring it up. <laughs> oh, fuck. Great fight. I'll bring fire. it up. I'll oh. bring it up on commentary. Shit. Oh, are you on the mics? Are you on the ones and twos again? By yourself? No. Who are you with? Maddie Williams? No, I think Barry Michael and uh, 
I'm not sure who the third person is because at um, some stage Barry's Barry's um cornering a couple of the boxes on the card. The boxes. So, he'll be there for the Muay Thai fights, and then I'll be let loose during the boxing commentary. <laughs> world, world champion boxer will, will be out, and I'll just be saying, "What the fuck I want." <laughs> so, um, speaking Muay Thai for the event, what's the what is the like? quote unquote biggest Muay Thai fight on the card for um, would they predominantly be undercard the Muay Thai on that? Yeah. The boxing sort of yeah. takes center stage for the well the, the, the main event uh is Jabba and Jonathan Hailu. So that's K1 a K one fight. fight yeah. mm-hmm. I think Jabba hasn't fought Muay Thai for eight years or something. Yeah. Um so they've done that as a K1 fight. So that's the main event and you know I know we're not supposed to talk about non Muay Thai related stuff here, but you know, Jabba comes from a big Muay Thai background. So does Jonathan. Yeah. And it'll be a really interesting fight because obviously there's tremendous hype around Jonathan Ailu. Mm. Um, and obviously he's got a massive fight on 1774 in May. So this will be a, a real good gauge. Jabba, like, fuck, Jabba's Jabba, but. He hasn't fought professionally in ages. I think his last fight was in one championship when he was fighting in one. Uh, who did he fight? Did he fight Elliot Compton or something? It was real random. He, no, he fought. Um, I'm pretty sure he fought Enrico Kell. I feel like. He and, fought- and then it was as part of the tournament. He fought Enrico and then he went on to fight Sammy Sanna. That's right. Yeah. But he's actually fought in Australia since then. Who did what? He fought Jonathan Tuhu. Ah, oh, correct, correct. Was that before or after one? That was after one. Yeah. So that would have been three years ago on yep. Alpha Fight Promotion, Alpha. Peter Haddon's yep. show. Mm. I should remember that. I taped his glove up in the back because the gut kid that was there whole trying to hold bats for Jabba. <laughs> it was, <laughs> I was sitting there. I was there to help Big Al and Roy, and I was feeling so sick. And Peter was obviously running the show and Jab was there with some poor kid that's probably like just one of the kids at the gym that helps out with stuff. And the guy didn't know how to lace up gloves. So they kind of figured it out. And then he was getting a bit frustrated. So I ended up taping it up for him. And then I sat down and I watched this poor kid trying to warm up Jab with his <laughs> little pads. And Jab was like, now put the pad down. And I'm like, oh, this is... Uh, Quite frightening. <laughs> like, please don't die. <laughs> um, so, yeah, go the, ahead. The, 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 the thing I'm interested to see, though, is, like, we know that um, Jonathan Ayulu, like, he, he's hurt a lot of guys before and he's knocked them out. And, he, like, um, Jamie Elaine springs to mind. Um, he obviously fought. Jonathan too, but there was a massive size difference. Like that was apparent as soon as he stepped in the ring. Yeah. He did his knee against Ching yeah. on um, Rogue that time. I think it's like his ACL. But and then my thing though is the reason I think this is a really good fight to see is it's like right if anyone is going to absorb it and take the shots, it's going to be someone like Jabba. And what happens then when Jabba absorbs those shots? Like what's what what Aolu will we see then? And then of course it being K one as well. And 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 he's a clean Aolu is a, a really clean striker, but I'm really interested to see because I just I don't think he'd be able to walk. He won't be able to walk through Java. No, so. and for for me, I think Jonathan's amazing. And you know, we've, I've been chatting to him forever about <clears throat> trying to coordinate the time for him to be on Rebellion, but I think he hasn't had the decent name, big name fight exposure in Australia to really mm. see where he's at. Mm. Like I've seen him fight guys like Reef and Ricardo and stuff with Victorian guys who like, you know, they're, they're, they're under 10 fight fight experience. The most experienced guys I've seen him fight was Ching where he hurt his knee and also um, Lewis's other boy on eruption. Yep. Um, which he ended up stopping him, but he was getting cut during that fight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that went to the points in in. Oh no, he did stop him in the third. He ended up stopping him. Fight, yeah. And I just think Jonathan hasn't had, and I could be wrong, but I haven't seen him get that. And it's partly because that seventy kilo division is kind of just starting to come back up again. But I haven't seen yeah. him against 
a, a top tier guy other than Jamie that I would say this is where he stands. So it'll be interesting. And even though it's not Muay Thai, it is like, and Jabba's getting a bit old. It'll be like, all right, dude, like, are you, are you everything that's claimed that you're going to be? So. And do you, Hugh, that's, um, that's your weight division. Have you put your, have you put your head to, to fighting him before? Is that something that you'd like? I'd to love do? to see Hugh wow. against Java under K1 rules. <laughs> not Java, you did like it. <laughs> um, Hugh, Aulu, is that one? I think Aulu is the consensus number one at junior middleweight. So yeah. I think if you want to, and also I think Jonathan is the, the ticket to the world rankings, right? Like he's, yeah. I believe, the only 70 kilo fighter in Australia that holds a ranking with the WBC. So if you want to uh, establish a platform to move into that world ranking and, and get in that system, I think that's one you have to be gunning for. I've chatted to him about it. Um, he's a pretty nice guy, Jonathan. Um, yeah, I would definitely like to fight. I, I think if you're looking to establish yourself as, as a top player at 70 kilos, that's the fight. I think you have to be looking at who's currently number one and that's who you have to want to fight. Mm. I don't think that you can really argue that Jonathan's in that number one spot right now. Mm. Yeah, he, 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 I mean, when you look at, and it's, that's, that's a stacked division internationally. Yep. We're quite sparse on it nationally or it's coming back, like Sai si says. It's not like it used to be. But when you look at the international top 10 rankings, that is a very, very, very dangerous division to end Oh, up. come on. Yodlicha, get out of here. <laughs> Man, that is a dangerous division. So, but Jonathan, yeah, Jonathan's ranked 12th. Um, he's one spot ahead of the UK's Josh Hill, which I'm not sure if Josh would continue to fight at 70. He's pretty big. Um, well, he was actually matched with, or maybe he still is, uh, James Honey. That was interesting yeah. to me. I didn't think they lined up in terms of size. Definitely. Honey's got a bit so, of I saw, I saw Josh actually helped me in the corner when we were in the UK for Max's fight, and I saw him then, and he's quite big. I think he's, yeah. he's grown quite a lot. Um, and he, he's a... He, He's a fan. He he knows a lot of the Aussie boys because he's trained in Thailand a lot of the time with the Aussie. I mean, and you know him quite well as well. Yeah. Don't you? you were there at the same time as him when he and Davey were training at Capon Tip, and you were there too, weren't you? So, oh no, you were at. Um, I was at PK. PK. Right. But, um, yeah. the, I guess Kieran, like one of the limitations when you look at that and you go, Jonathan's number twelve, mm. um, and this is the the rest of the world rankings is. Unfortunately, I feel like the world rankings, it's not that these guys are all fighting each other in the same circuit and then they get ranked by it. It's that every region is submitting their best guy mm. um, based on activity and recommendations. And then based on the, the sort of win-loss ratio, that's kind of where they get ranked. And it's a little bit of a yeah. um, subjective thing. Where it's like, well, if you get a guy who's ranked maybe top ten in a top ten internationally from Australia, in let's say you know lightweight or super lightweight, but you take them and put them against fifty ties at that weight, they're going to lose to all those fifty ties and relatively get some. So while it's so good that there is a ranking, that does become the limitation. It's like, well, yeah, you're, you're number twelve, but how many ties? How many? French and how many whatever English guys are there for you to have you fought to earn that top 12 um, standing? Absolutely. And I think this is a difficulty that we have in our sport because we still do have a sport where the hemispheres are so divided yeah. that it's difficult to get an accurate representation across the board right like but it's just but not, even nationally and statewide i mean like it's a point where absolutely new south Wales guys fight new south Wales guys victorian guys fight victorian guys then we have a national ranking that's devoid of the fact that, that they haven't really ever fought each other a lot of them but until we have you know the promoters you know like 10 15 promoters who do muay thai at the size that one championship does it where you realistically are going to have guys cross like cross hemisphere. I mean, say we, we, we went to, you know, I went to the UK with Max and so we went all the way to England, but that's not happening often. 
Aussies yeah. aren't going to Europe and vice versa. It's just so hard. And yeah. it, it, it's obvious, right? We don't have the money in our sport. So that's where this, this conversation comes into it as well. But what but that's it, that, it's not just in, even in Muay Thai. Like you think about Tim Zhu, the guys he's fought, predominantly Australian guys, one Japanese guy, and then he becomes the WBO mandatory challenger for the world title. And you're like, you say what? Yeah. Like it's, it's earning points, climbing up a ladder and then getting to go there. And it's, uh, it's not like tennis or something or uh, other sports that have one world championships and you get ranked and it's like, you're the sixth fastest man in the world. I was seventh. Um, but yeah, so we don't get that perfect ranking. Fuck you, Kieran. But that's, I mean, it's just professional sport, isn't it? Like that's, I mean, I made a point of that, that if you're known and you're front of mind, you get more opportunity. Like it's as simple as that. Yeah. yeah. So you don't, in Thai boxing, boxing, it doesn't matter the sport. You can't wait for opportunities to come to you. You have to be front of mind. It's just, it's, it's, it just, it is what it is, right? Like all of the, all, a, a lot of the fighters that we can know and think of internationally genuinely have things like, a strong social media presence and a lot of followers on Facebook, like on, on Insta or TikTok or what have you, not necessarily because they're the best. I mean, and a, a, a really good example is Max. my girl oh. is, is a really good example is my girl, Gabrielle. Yeah. I fight. She's an amateur, but a lot of people know her because she's got 8,000 followers on Instagram <laughs> or something. And we get, and, and so sometimes you, you just, it's, it's an attention game. It's an entertainment game. That's what sports is at the end of the day. It's entertainment. So you're front of mind, you're known, you get the opportunities. And it's difficult. We're never, it's hard to just, it's, it's hard to get a realistic picture of these are the top 10 guys in the world. Yeah. It's, it's impossible. But going back to uh, Warriors Way 25, so it's the 25th Warriors Way show. Big shout out to Hammer. Oh, 25th Muay Thai Hour, 25th Warriors Way. Oh, man. 25th what Rebellion is- coming up. You are know, yeah. training. Both of us. We're working on a dietitian as we speak. Um, yep. <laughs> so, uh, and big shout out to Carl Draper, 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 who was ori- one of the ri- original founders of Warriors Way with Hammer. Shout out. So, um, the card this weekend at the Melbourne Pavilion is uh, three Muay Thai fights, um, starting with Ben Wotherspoon, who on that same uh, alpha fight promotion lost the split points decision to John O'Arman. He's having his third fight against the boy, I believe, from the Northern Territory, Joshua Sarmiento. So that's a heavyweight fight. Um, the next Muay Thai fight is Alistair Melody, who was the opening fight of the last route show. He's fighting... Aaron McFarlane from uh, Hammers Gym. That's another heavyweight bout. Then this next fight is going to be a sick little fight, guys. Zane Braniff, he fought in the last route show. He's fighting a guy called Doi Tran from Laos to his gym. He used to get trained by my mate, um, Dan Carter. He's had five or six amateurs and won them all. And um, from what Dan told me ages ago, he's a handy little goer at, um, I think, 57 kilos. So... That's the three Muay Thai fights. And then there's um, a few professional boxing fights. Connor Reed versus Robert Lale. Um, K1 rules is Dean Bujic from Eight Blade Warriors. He's fighting Chris Burridge at, I think, 74 kilos. Burridge from, from the nation's capital, Karen, or am I getting mixed up? From, from Stock A Gym, yes, correct. Okay. And at, at 74 kilos, he is tiny. Yeah, that's the those. I, I didn't wrong. think it that. Could, it could be 72 and a half. Um, but I don't think Dean gets below that. And Dean's one of those guys, man, like <clears throat> I've had him on a couple of times. I think he fought Adam Palomara from Andy's gym on uh, Roots Concrete Jungle. Um, it's hard. He's always ready to fight and we always struggle to match him up. So um, he's taken this fight on the K1 rules. Shout out to Hammer bringing another opponent out from uh, ACT on Grand Prix weekend. <laughs> <laughs> the next fight's a professional boxing fight. This is a this is my call for outside of Jabba and um, Jonathan. The fight of the night. It's Jamie Edenden 
who's a professional boxer slash MMA fighter. She just yeah. recently fought on Eternal. Um, she's fighting a girl, Stephanie. I'm not going to say her same name. It's M F O N G W O T. Give I'm it a go. Those letters is silent. <laughs> go. Give I think it a go. She's um, from Cameroon, uh, originally a high level amateur boxer. They've been trying to match her forever, like for the last three, four years as a pro fight. And um, this will be a really sick fight. That Jamie girl, I, I saw her last MMA fight and she, she goes. I am pretty sure. Jamie originally was from Richard Neridal's gym. Yes. On, like in Fort yep. like, Boxing and stuff like a long, long, long time ago. She's, yeah. Yeah, because they there. brought her down from when he uh, brought his show back down south. She mm. was on the card. There you go. Well, nice, Jamie. Yeah, so that's a big fight. Um, the next fight is Orono Wille. Um, his opponent's been changed. It was originally going to be River Daz, but now he's fighting another pro debut boxer uh, from Melbourne, who's, um, I think, a two-time national champion as an amateur. One time, a two-time national champion. So, unfortunately, River won't be on. I think poor guy was in fight camp from September till... Two weeks ago, after the lockdown show, then Hammer's show, then he got offered that No Limits uh, fight against uh, Stevie Sparks in December. Got, yeah. That got postponed. He kept training all the way up until March, had that fight, and then sort of got straight back into training camp. And I think they just made a decision that he, he kind of needed a break. So um, that would have been a tough call to make because obviously River's a big crowd favorite here. So, um, but... Hammers uh, still looked after Orono as well and got him another opponent here. Nice. So that'll be great. And then, yeah, obviously the main event is Jabba and Jonathan. Mm. Mm. And then uh, one at the next day, do we not have the Victorian Muay Thai? One more thing. Oh, sorry. Hopefully we've put this up by then, but the live stream will be on livecombatsports.com. Make sure you get it. And uh, yes, and then the next day, after months and months of waiting, we finally get to go see LAB live at, in, oh wait, we're not talking about the concert I'm going to, cool. Oh. Um, You're going to a concert like at night? Is it at night? That's the one thing we do when there's no lockdowns, my wife and I always go to reggae gigs. Stop, like after 8 p.m. or something? Like after 8, 8 p.m. Sun has set? Yep. Stop it. What time do you get home? Like 10 30, 11, and then the next oh, day, I'm just horrible to be around. <laughs> this is wild, man. Yeah, right. Okay. So, um, notwithstanding the reggae concert, <clears throat> Boy Die Victoria. Yes. Excellent. Tell us um, about So, at the moment, we have 14 bouts matched, which we're quite happy with because Vam is running on the same day as well. Um, they had to move their day. Yeah. Um, and Hammer's got a few amateur fights at the start of the Warriors' way card, so we're sort of got three amateur events running, but we all sort of work with each other anyway, so it works out well. But yeah, we've got we've got fourteen bouts back at the one of those fucking places out in the suburbs that I don't often go to, other than for Muay Thai. No, um, Westgate Indoor Leisure Centre, nice. which is right next door to uh, downstairs from Warriors um, Eight for Eight Warriors. And it's actually super convenient to get to. So that's this Sunday, $30 on the door. What do you think, so si, is the main? Because I, I would just assume that something like what you run there, which is very much, for those who don't know it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but a fully padded, almost like IFMA style amateur competition of three twos, amateur tie boxing. I, 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 I would assume that, it should just be packed, like a full day of fights, not 12 or 14, like 30. 40. So we've been getting 20s, and our plan is <clears throat> as we grow, we don't really want to do more than sort of 25 fights. So if we're getting that amount of thing of like 40 fights, whatever, I think we're just going to run events more regularly. Mm. We don't want it to be a thing where the entire Sunday from morning to night, you're there we you know a i think it kind of gets a bit much for the trainers to be there all day b yeah. once again the four of us who run it 
are just a volunteer group. So we don't want to be there from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and, and we are just getting used to like people are still just coming around to what it is we're doing. Obviously, we've, we used to have uh, the Victorian Amateur Combat Sports Association years ago. Then we have, we've got VAMA and we do things a little bit differently to VAMA. We do full tie, smaller gloves, three by twos, Muay Thai only. They do K1. They do VAMA. So people are just getting the gist of it. Mm. And we're getting a lot of good nominations too. Um, but yeah, the, the, the field is still developing. Um, so hopefully we can get a few more matchups. We'd like to hit that sort of 24 mark and that'll be a good number for us. Because I feel like it is something that we miss across the board nationally. They're just having these sort of events, like you're running in Victoria, and and to an extent, sort of what Andy and a few others do with development days, and then even the amateur parts of their shows, where guys aren't hyping it up or building it up too much, and there's no flash. It's just like a ring in a basketball stadium, and you fight, and you could probably do it twice a month. And, and to change the perception that people have and just crank them out. Because the reason that we have, I know we speak about it all the time, but for me, the way I look at it, the reason that we, we are lacking those guys in, say, like the 70 kilo division or whatever is because there's not enough of those kind of events around the country where the guys can rack up the experience quickly enough. Because I think if we, we need to look at three or four or five years down the track now, otherwise we'll continue to have the same issue. Well, if, if this keeps going the way it is, and we, we've got a couple of things coming through with rankings for the fighters and the clubs, that's going to be on our side and all that. If this goes the way it is, I think in two years' time, the, like just watching the quality of guys that have fought in the last three, if we can keep them interested, obviously out of 10 guys competing, maybe one will turn pro. But if we've got the numbers... Some of the guys having first, second, third fights, man, like, because, awesome. and we're not scoring it if Mastal, we're, we, we're still kind of, with, with the judging, it's still going to, it's still like, you can catch and dump, you can do all that stuff. We're still looking for power, all that sort of stuff. The style and some of the guys like, um, Don Miller's got uh, his little Japanese kid, um, Corey's got two guys that are great. Ben White's got a 70 kilo dude. There was a few guys last show that I was like, holy shit, you could take the pads off. I'm chucking them in. And they look like they could make their pro debut tomorrow. Mm. I got to get my laptop charger. You guys talk. Don't say anything bad about me because I'll get it edited out. And okay. you, I've you got don't a, want to be getting the early morning flight. I've got a good, I've got a good question for you, Hugh. Oh, Wait. I've got a thing. Remind me when I come back. Yeah. Talk about the nominations for the amateurs and a funny story. Okay. Three by two versus three by three. I no, am. I don't should be fighting three by three. Fuck, don't. Just get the charger, mate. I am of the opinion that from the moment you turn 18, regardless of amateur or professional or whatever form you are competing in, that you that everyone fights three by three. Yeah, I agree. And my reasoning behind this is three by two is a very short period of time. Everyone is fit enough. Usually the part where you lose out on a three by two competition is an adrenaline dump or it's just in your brain. Because yeah. as I say to my guys, if I told you to go outside right now, and run three minute, two minute rounds as hard as you can, you could put in a lot of effort and you could push straight to the end. Most people for my liking train enough that they could do three by two, no sweat. And I think if we then, if we shifted to every person over the age of 18, regardless of the format for three by three, we would have less washing machine style fighting and more technical tie boxing would continue to flourish without the need to have to like panic and rush and go forward and make it a mess. Yeah. And I, I see I, like your point is like, I could grab any person from our gym who, who trains a fair bit, who's in there more than three days a week. 
you have the fitness to fight three two minute rounds like like i always have this conversation with guys who are having kind of their first or second fight and there's always that thing you know like worrying about being fit enough and then so i'm like it's not that long like really when you think about it like if i took you through pads for three two minutes you can do probably four or five three minute rounds of pad work every day if i took you through three by two minute rounds you'd be like this is pretty easy and what i've seen like you know i've been around a lot of different kind of training methodologies over the years i see people because they're going to and in new south wales we've had this problem a little bit people who spend an unnecessarily long amount of time in the amateurs and with that comes fighting two minute rounds they're kind of training to a two minute round format and there's a point where you go like are we wasting our time gearing our approach to make us good to you know come hard out of the gate and kind of steal these two minute rounds because that is now once you've put them in that three minute round format all of that is irrelevant like you've developed a skill that you don't need to take with you so i think getting guys fighting three minute rounds earlier because i hate these fights like i judge a lot of development days and stuff like that and you do see a lot of them Obviously, everyone just has to fight to the format that they're in. But you judge a lot of fights where you're like, one person was a better tie boxer, but he didn't necessarily win that fight. Mm. And that comes with just the format. And you go, this guy will go on to be good, and the other one will mm. have a couple of short fights and fizzle out, and that's fine. It's all just experience. But, yeah, I agree with you that I think it comes back to a problem is the two-minute rounds is probably an argument for maybe just in that when you're matching at that novice level not everyone wants to kind of take it all the way and maybe you just need to weed those guys out early on but yeah i think if someone's showing some promise and wants to have a a go with it and yeah they're over 18 i don't see any need to keep but especially like i don't even really like the the 90 second rounds like at all i've always wondered what the point of that is but um you know when you said you get someone at the gym and you're like, you're fit enough to do three, two minutes, not a problem. You can do three threes, blah, blah, blah. I think like you said earlier, Kieran, you have to take into account as a novice, having your first fight, two minutes feels like an hour and people need that entry. And I think that should be done at the amateur level, not at the pro level. And then potentially like, like with amateur boxing, like you have a set number of fights, like there's nothing wrong with, progressively increasing something and then going into okay you've done some of your amateur padded fights at two minutes and now at a elite level of amateur which we don't have but let's say you have five or ten amateurs at two minutes then you have three or four three three minute rounds and then you're into the pros and i just don't think pros should fight two minute rounds anymore um but but you you think about like, I don't know if you guys watched the boxing last night, the No Limit show. The girls' fight, the four two-minute round fight, was balls to the wall, like, ah! and they went for it. And if you watch Kalisha Shield fight, she fights 10 two-minute rounds, whereas the men fight 12 three-minute rounds, and you watch the pace of her fights. I watch women's professional boxing sometimes. By the time it starts, it's finished, right? Yeah. And that, that, that's been, that honestly, the biggest thing that made me make the call to not sanctioned with WBC anymore was that the women's fights for the titles had to be five twos. That's why when Diandra and Tiff fought, I was like, I'm not going to have two minute rounds on, on rebellion. Let's fight for a rebellion title. Cause it's like, they've got enough skills not to have this two minute blast fight. Mm, I, I just feel like even with the amateurs, the volume from the two minute round is the exact same of the volume in the three minute round. It's just applied better in the three minute round. Yeah. In the two minute round, it becomes a mash. They're like, and, and the difference for me between Thai boxing and boxing is in Thai boxing, there's a lot more room for just messiness because you've got the clinch and you've got guys, you know, kicking with bad timing and what have you, as opposed to just throwing hands. And the volume I think sometimes is no different. It's just in the two minute rounds, they're so rushed that it becomes messy because they know that they only have so long to perform. Whereas in the three minute round, they know that they're able to take that little bit extra time. Everyone in the gym, who in their gym hits, and I'd be curious to know, but we don't do two minutes, like 
even from guys doing dev days, they don't do pads on two minute rounds. We don't, we never have the buzzer on two minutes. But I think the train, but again, like you can't dismiss the fact that what you do at training is significantly, significantly different to what you do in an actual fight mm. and the impact and the crowd and adrenaline. It's like, yeah, you might do, you know, everyone does four minute rounds on pads but they fight three minute rounds or two minutes. And it's not nothing remotely, <clears throat> remotely the same. I had a, like a respectable trainer years ago on rebellion, insisted on putting his fighter into a five round fight. I was like, and that, that was early days of Melbourne Muay Thai kind of kicking along. And I said, I'm telling you, I've seen this guy fight once. He doesn't have it in him to do a five round fight at the moment. Because that, the way they were training, what around, and the kid got absolutely one of the worst beatings I've ever seen <laughs> at the start of the fourth round. Because I could just see he'd gone Rrr! and done it, but it was like, man, like you don't have the preparedness to do it. And he went for that. He wanted to finish his opponent early, and he just didn't have the maturity to do it. And one argument would be like, give him more experience to do it. But I think you can just step it up, go fight the three twos fight three threes, fight five by threes. But when you fight professional without pads, especially without pads, I don't think you should fight two minute rounds. And the other thing is, Kieran, like other consideration on an amateur day, it's not like a normal fight show. Imagine doing so many three minute round fights and all those minutes yeah. add up. Time, yeah, I appreciate the time it would take for sure. And I, that, that's the main detractor I see is in trying to, to get that through. So, I mean, you look at the UK scene and they do C-class fights for a minute and a half in the UK. Yeah. Um, so, fuck, I don't, who knows? I'm going to put a little poll or question up on Insta and clip this conversation out. So basically the same two people answering, you now will answer that poll. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hugh and, Hugh and, Hugh and Jake Davis. I'm really annoyed that this, <laughs> Jake Davis. I'm really annoyed that this guy on Instagram who's hacked into Elias's Instagram account Tried to have a chat with him this morning. He's trying to crack into mine. I offered to ask my friends on the helicopter I was on to do it, and he's seen it, and he's not responding. I'm just disappointed that it wasn't Ilias that asked for a picture of my penis. But anyway. Um, yes, but anyway, my, my nominations, interest, sorry. Nominations. My nominations. So we've got a very detailed nomination thing for Muay Thai Victoria um, saying, even if you've had jujitsu experience, put everything in. Because as a first timer, if you're going into a fight and someone has previous combat sports experience, we just want to be upfront. Hmm. And my friends who did this, if you listen to this, please be, don't be offended. I just find it <laughs> supremely comical that the thinking behind it. So they nominate a fighter with three interclubs. Interclubs are like non-contact, two one and a half minute round things people do here. We offer it to the, another gym. The other gym. Facebook searched this kid as a picture of him sitting in Thailand, ready for his fight with his mask on, gloved up, greased up, sitting on a chair, waiting to go. So the lovely Spring Seer contacts them back and says, has he had a professional fight? Yeah, it wasn't a great fight. It was in Thailand. It was one fight. So we figured that <laughs> that one fight professionally in Thailand is the equivalent of three inter-club fights here. I, out of the kindness of my heart, they have a super middleweight at their gym who's a professional with nine fights, offered them a kid with 210 interclub fights. <laughs> but, and I don't think they want to fight Toby Smith because I figured 70 <laughs> professional fights by the super calculated of three interclubs is 210 interclub fights. Why wouldn't you fight him? What's the exchange rate? Yeah. I, know. Uh, what I like that you <laughs> apply that logic yourself, but don't explain it. Like, you're just like, we've had three. Yeah, like, no, no, yeah. <laughs> just what it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That was that was what it was. Yeah. That's a tricky one in general, though, right? Because I remember, well, maybe it happens a little bit less, but you did used to get people who'd had done the Thailand thing and gone over and had a couple of low-level Thailand fights, and they would just say zero. They didn't even right. try to uh, make a ratio to interclass. Whereas it's like, it's a hard one too, because it doesn't fit. I mean, like, it's actually not that hard. You say I've had three fights in Thailand or whatever, but it's difficult or has been difficult in the past to what that actually aligns to 
back over here because if you're going to say amateur, well, apparently three low level Thailand fights would equal nine nine inter- interclubs. Yeah, so I think this is the formula that's to work. Actually, on. yeah, it was this simple all along. <laughs> but that's the danger of it. Like, um, I think we were talking about this last week, but like Ryan Shepherd, who fought Jordan Barkey yep. on Roots, he had a sponsorship in Thailand at one of the gyms, and they were putting him in the Phuket fights. And they're like, he was sending them back. Like there were fights, but there's, and he was cranking them out. They were fighting really often. He was staying there. And I said to him, I'm like, man, you're going to come back to Melbourne with a record of like 16 and 0 or 16, 14 wins, two losses at that weight. And then all of a sudden I've got to say, okay, well, you're fighting um, Jamie or you're yeah. fighting Jonathan Aylin because there's so many fights here. Yeah. It's like, dude, these, these, these aren't the same level of fights but on your record it just keeps ticking along and then we had to do like matching him with someone like aram was easy because i was like aram this is his videos this is his fights aram didn't quite understand what i was saying so he nodded and agreed to it anyway <laughs> but anyway no but like if it's someone who understands it but you say to another gym and they're like he's had 16 fights it's like yeah but but this is this is the thing that we have to to do with and we've spoken about it before and it was um, and Hugh, you spoke about it on the combat chat with Shane when <clears throat> you were talking about the match. Hey, don't plug out a fucking podcast here. <laughs> my uh, my boy um, Dan Talker when he was due to fight Kai, mm. and that was Dan's oh. eight eight. Sorry, Tinkler. Sorry, Dan that was his, that was his eighth fight. But five of his fights were on Albel Cup. Yeah, one day it was three, and the other day it was two. And then he had, you know, maybe one more amateur fight. And then, like, and, and on a show, his first amateur fight was on a show. His next fight on a show show was a pro, his pro debut against Reese. Against Reese, yeah. Or pro against Kai. Because on his record, it's like, oh, well, he's had eight fights. And whether or not the opponents that he fought or beat were of a certain caliber is neither here nor there. But it was kind of like, well, fuck, you just have to rise to it now because you've had this number of fights and that's the expectation. And a lot of people, it's hard to have that conversation, I find, as a trainer, where you go, no, look, but the majority are on this. And still some trainers go, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, he's still had way more fights. And so you just kind of had to, they just have to rise to the occasion. Like, Yeah. You think part of the problem is someone who's had... You know, in, in Western Australia, when they fight, they're, if, when they're registered to fight, their first few fights have a certain amount of padding, then a certain amount of padding. Yeah. But they're pros, but it's just reduced padding until a free-for-all. Then New South Wales, you guys have the class system. Um, Victoria, we have a defined amateur boxing style. There's amateurs, there's professionals. So we can just go, he's had eight padded amateur fights, he's having this. Everyone has it state by state. You have a different understanding of it. And then, yeah. you know, Queensland, again, I've seen guys fight professionally and then all of a sudden fight for an amateur world title, which has a different understanding altogether, which is kind of like the old definition of amateur kickboxing that used to be around. They yeah. kind of, so do you think that's a bigger problem that we're dealing with? It's just, there's no absolute, no consistency. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think Victoria's system is like, I would like to see the way you guys are putting it together get done everywhere. To me, that's the most logical way to do it. I, I, I would like to, I would like to have just the same, <laughs> the same uh, system that is applied to what people, know for, what people know for boxing. Yeah. That's going to be the easiest, right? You've got an amateur record. You've got a pro record. Do you think I should make a little um, book? And just have all my rules and stuff for how Muay Thai should run and just give everyone a copy of it. Like maybe make a little red cover for it. If and everyone just carries this little red book that has everything, all the rules and stuff in it. And we that's, just. That's a highbrow joke, man. I don't know how many people. Oh, it's usually <laughs> behind me. They're all holding little red I, books. I don't know how many people are even going to understand the significance of the poster behind you. This is not, man, I, I don't think. Come on. Let me just change it to it's something not more upbeat. Ah, oh, yeah. beautiful. Very Everyone nice. Very nice. Is that Danny's? No, that's actually Danny bought that for my 40th birthday. That's nice. Yeah. 
two decades ago. Um, so yeah, I think a boxing system, a clearly defined amateur versus pro, reset the record at pro, make decisions based off of that. It- oh, and while we're talking about amateur and pro and boxing, Cuba, first time oh, in 60 uh, years. Welcome Good back, luck, everybody else. Of professional <laughs> boxing. As I said, it's like, it'll take away a little bit of the uh, attention away from the how uh, unfair transgenders in women's sports is. It's like going to be now for them now. It's going to be like, Man, but oh. it's so unfair. These Cubans, I don't get to win a gold medal. They, they know how to box. I want to see some Cuba versus Mexico pro shows, man. Oh, I just that. want to watch um, that Andy, uh, the guy that won the last uh, Olympics for uh, Cuba. I just want to watch him in the pros. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. I had a question for you, Sai, as uh, someone who's involved with the amateur and the pro in Victoria. Well, yep. Kieran tends to Australia. Um, for how you're putting it together in the, like what I'm seeing a lot in New South Wales at the moment is, um, you know, someone stays amateur X number of fights and all the chatter is, why did they, why are they still an amateur? Why haven't they gone pro? And being that you're putting together the, sort of grassroots layer and the higher end professional when you're looking at someone who's pretty good in the, the Muay Thai Victoria days how many fights do you want to see them kind of like ideally as you build the system out how many would you like to see them get done in that format before they take the pads off I think and again I'm one of four people involved in it so this is just what I'm going to say is our model is that it's not pro disguised as amateur, amateur disguised as pro or vice versa. So I think in some settings, people fight amateur, but get the payoff of being in a fight promotion. Yep. So they get to do that and win titles and do stuff. So they get to live their full sort of their best life as an amateur, but kind of being a pro. But Mm. the way we've set up Muay Thai Victoria is that do you want to stay and just develop a long-term amateur padded career and just be the king of amateur Muay Thai? Good for you. If that's what you want to do and you have some ambitions to go to IFMA and you want to do that, that's fine. But then it goes completely on the fighter is like there's separate entities. The Combat Sports Board of Victoria doesn't, they oversee us, but we're not interlinked. So if you want to go from this thing where you're fighting in basketball stadiums with no walkout music and you get a medal at the end of it and you want to turn pro, that's up to you. And again, there's guys, Kenta from Don's Gym has had three amateurs. He'll turn pro next. Um, And it's completely up to them. But we don't have that thing where it's like, I want to stay amateur so I can win an amateur Victorian title. You you don't. Mm. Like we might do the boxing model of, there's a novice title or whatever as those amateurs who's the best performing five, but we're not going to do that. We're not going to give belts and stuff for amateurs. So if you want to get ranked and fight on a pro style show, you turn pro. Mm. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Mm. And- Kieran, are you seeing a little bit like, do you find that based on how matches are coming together for shows, like I know our development days, which I, I suppose are the most similar to Moza Victoria, People do tend to treat those a bit more like just one to get your feet wet before you move on. It's not like anyone really wants, and some gyms do it. I've never, like you see guys having their six, seven development day. I I don't think really has a point, but I'm kind of starting to feel like the amateur layer between development day and pro is kind of dissolving. Like there's not that many amateur fights because I think our amateur system here is kind of, doesn't really know what it wants to be because you're not wearing shin guards and you're wearing 10 ounce gloves and you've got a proper um, tape and gauze hand wrap on, but you're wearing headgear and fighting on it. I'm finding it's becoming a little bit more like people are doing a bit of development day, but then the attention very quickly becomes just going pro. Like that amateur layer is kind of yeah. neither here nor there. Yeah, I I use that. I think I've not traditionally put a lot of people in development days, but I'm starting to do it now as a way to see how they go. Like just one. And I tell everyone here at the gym, that's the, that's like, 
the quote unquote pathway is you have a development day and then you go to amateur. Um, and some people realistically could go straight to amateur. And as you would know, when we nominate fighters in New South Wales now, promoters will often say, oh, do you want to do this fight amateur or do you want to do this fight development day? They don't, yeah. you're not necessarily restricted to the one. But yeah, there is definitely like, there's a design flaw which has come about because of New South Wales combat sports. And so it's like an adaptation to legislation. But my favorite, for me, um, I, I like the way it's done in Victoria. However, I also like, I really do like the way it's done in Western Australia, the concept of it, which is in essence, a class system, mm. which is, okay, this many to this many, this is the rules. This many to this many, exactly. So yeah. that's the rules. And it, and it goes through there. This is when you take the shin guards off. This is when you do here. I feel like that's so concise and helps carry people through every stage that then promoters and trainers don't have to deal with the conversations of my guys had this many development days and my guys done this and you've done that. And then promoters like Andrew are having, to, or, or, or even Lewis, you know, he's got his SRG show coming up, having to mm. try and juggle and put things together when it's like, for me, it's a, it's a New South Wales combat sport legislation design floor. And from that it's created issues. Like, like it gives you too much choice. It gives right, you too like, much choice. Exactly. Give, yeah. less, give less choice. Like tell people this is what it is and that's it. And I think Andy's done a great job as have a few other people in New South Wales to cement and grow that development day system. I for one would like to see it's like, right. Okay. Development day. You can only do a max of three times. And then when you become an amateur, your first three amateur ones, maybe you are, it's like IFMA style. Maybe yeah. it is IFMA style, like it's eight or tens, but then you have the cloth shin guards as well. And you've got the headgear and then you've got the elbow pads. And it's like, okay, after three amateur, those cloth shin guards come out. You've got your gloves, your elbows, your headgear. Maybe you do three or four of them and then go pro. And then go pro. And then when you go pro, maybe your first two or three pros, quote unquote, what we would call pros, you, it's just elbow guards. Maybe elbow pads, yeah. Yeah, elbow pads. And, oh, no problem with that. Like, And then after that, done. And it's this clear, structured bang, 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 bang. Done. But don't you think you can have <clears throat> the clear structure, give people choice, but not too many choices, and have the structure, which is some people, like with the development days, it gets hard because if someone has had eight development days, then they're fighting guys with, their first or second development day, I guess you have to make a level with that. But, and it pains me to say this of all people, maybe some people want to just do the Muay Thai with headgear and elbow pads and shin pads, and that's their extent of their career. And they're going to have mm. 10, 15 and fight evenly matched guys, not show up to work with a cut on their forehead and do it. And that's it. And they don't want to become pros and they can do that. And we don't say, nope, You've had five. Now take the elbow pads off, gun, and start getting a massive fucking tight tattoo. It's like, I, I feel like, don't give them too many options, but go, yeah. you can be a pro. You fight full Muay Thai, three minute rounds. At a better level, you fight five threes. You can fight amateur with elbow pads, and you can have as many of them as you want, but you don't get to fight a first time. Like if you had 10 amateurs, you got to fight another bloke with eight or 10 amateurs, and the level goes up. But it's not like if someone doesn't want to be limping around all week, no problem. Fight with class chin guards. Yeah, and fine. But realistically, that person is going to run out of opportunities because yeah. how many people are wanting to stay at that level? I just don't. I think I, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I, I think the, the reality is, is that they'll just run out of opportunities. And they if the similar situation was in boxing, I probably would close the fighting side of my gym because I don't particularly want a lot of my guys fighting professional boxing and becoming donkeys after six years. For and sure. if they want to have 20 amateur boxing fights, I'm more than happy for them. But if someone said you got to have four amateur boxing fights and now you're fighting. For sure. No, no. But then boxing, but boxing is a different beast altogether because way more. A lot more popular fight. and has more, more participation. You're right. No, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. No, no, that's a hundred percent. That is no word of a lie. It is more popular and it has more participation. So it's like, yeah, 100%. But it's hard to, to do the application of both. Yeah. 
But then as you build these systems, I guess it always becomes a question of like, would it enhance Muay Thai's participation rate if it had like a layer where you could just jump in to do, like I think we all want Muay Thai to grow. So we build systems to progress people through. And that is at times possibly ignorant of the idea that some people want to do it, but they don't want to progress beyond like, we're all trying to come up with a system for like, this is how we're going to get this guy to pro. And are we listening to these guys going, I actually don't even want to go pro. Because Muay Thai is like one of the only sports where, or it's a combat sports thing where participating for a certain amount of time means you, your only option is to progress to pro. Like you can, you can go down to your local field and play football for as long as you want without you anyone being You get a like, crew belt from uh, Master Toddy. <laughs> True. I need to go and get one of those. All right. I think Kieran has to go. I'm going to go. Um, I wanted to get uh, Hugh to score his last fight, but we, we won't do that. Um, Next one. Hugh, it was lovely to have you. You're a, have thank you. Thanks for the invite. How did you unmute yourself, Kieran? Um Combat sports podcast is it weekly? Weekly, if we're weekly, if we're on our game. Combat awesome. chat. And your next fight is May twenty eighth, Unrebellion Muay Thai twenty five in Melbourne. Obviously, Arams told you that. Yes. Wait. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I figured it out. Huh? You there too? You will definitely see me then. Nice. I'm waiting. This being the next week where you were going to tell me about one of your fighters, Kieran. That's yeah. great. Yeah, man. All right, awesome. And then hopefully in about two weeks, I'll have a really big, good rebellion related announcement. Nice. Good luck this I'm week, Kieran. Thank you. Appreciate and I'll remember it. Remember to tell Hammer you tried to wipe out the whole Warriors Way thing. Oh, God. See you guys. Goodbye.